This afternoon, I am pleased to have as our chronicle of outstanding leaders in dentistry, Herbert Schilder, DDS of Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome, Herb. We're delighted that you've been able to take the time to come and discuss some of the things of your life in dentistry. As you know, this is a project sponsored by the United States of America section of the International College of Dentists and is housed in the National Museum of Dentistry in Baltimore. Let us get started, Herb, by saying to you, give me some early impressions of your life, your early days, your family, your mom and dad, and those influences as you recall as a kid. Well, the, the major influence on me, of course, were my folks, but the major characteristics of me were to identify very early the things that I wanted to do and things that I wanted to accomplish and things that I wanted to experience. And I guess I was a tough little rascal because I think at the age of four, I kind of had my own mind. <laughs> and while I respected the folks, it was like living two paths at the same time, the one in the family and the other in the bigger outside world that I wanted to explore. Now, your, your father's profession or work was? My father drove a truck. Okay. My father was in the fruit and produce business with his brother, and uh, he was up at 3.30 every morning, winter and summer, to be down in the produce market, buying the materials, and then delivering them. Their specialty was to deliver to restaurants. Lived a tough life. He was my size and must have weighed 50 pounds more and was all muscle. And your mom was a... a live-at-home mom. Live-at-home mom who looked after the children and wanted the best for the kids. And how many brothers and sisters do we have? One sibling and uh, he's a dentist, four years older than I. Married an English wife so he retired about 15 years ago. <laughs> she always said if I was the smart one of the family how come I worked so hard? <laughs> but he's a great guy and uh, my only sibling but we are very close. And, and you grew up in New York? Grew up in Brooklyn, New York when there was a book written recently and it said when Brooklyn was the world and in those days we thought it was. And so you went to school, your early days were in Brooklyn. Early days were in Brooklyn and uh, I kind of went through school fast. Uh, I had learned to read when I was three thanks to mom and I didn't go to kindergarten because I didn't want to be there with the kids. In the first three years I skipped a half a year each year and got out of high school when I was uh, not quite 13 years old. I was 12 and a half years old. I was graduated from college when I was 19. And I was just zipping along and I had no idea what I wanted to be. Now during those years, was there any individual that had real impact on motivating you, on getting you to achieve those quick grades and those uh, and that, that artistic thing of, of learning fast. Uh, and were there people that you recall that were, had impact? Well, there was, a, there was a mentor at New York University at Washington Square College, and uh, he was a music professor. I had taken a course in music appreciation uh, just to fill out the baccalaureate requirements. And uh, he, he changed my life, really from being a uh, bright, active student who was going to conquer the world to maybe somebody who still wanted to do that but had a softer edge. And I remember one time, well, this fellow was so, so knowing that uh, he suggested that I take a year of either Wagnerian opera or Beethoven symphony. As I said, I can't read music. He said, whatever you get in comparative anatomy, I'll give you that grade ah. in this. So during those days then, uh, you, you had graduated from high school at 19, and you went to... Graduated from college. Uh, college. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. And that <coughs> was a portion of New York University? Yes, that was the, lo the liberal arts college of New, oh, York, New York University. York, okay. And then you continued on to dental school? Not, not immediately. Okay, tell I, us about that. I didn't plan to be a dentist. I think if it were possible, I would have spent a life as the director of extracurricular activities for a large university. I was having so much fun at school. But there I was at 19 and out of school. I took one year and I took some graduate programs in enzyme chemistry and in botany at Brooklyn College, which was nearby. And I thought that was like going back to high school. 
And during that time, New York State developed scholarships for physicians and dentists. And there were 36 for upstate New York and 14 for New York City. And uh, my brother said, why don't you take one of those exams? I said, why? He said, you might like to be a dentist. I love it. And I took the exam, and I received one of those 14 scholarships. And Dick, they paid the whole tuition, which in a private school then was $600 for the year, <laughs> with $150 extra. And I thought, this is heaven. How could I not go to dental school? So that was the main reason that you went into dental school. That's the main reason I went into dental school. Your brother then really did have some impact on you by just sort of encouraging you to continue. Oh, surely, surely. And did he, was he also uh, practiced, where did your brother practice? My brother practiced in Manhattan at 157 West 57th Street. Had a very fine practice, but it's a huge building with 500 professional people. And I early on said, I am never going to practice in New York City. So he did teach you that. Uh, now, think back to those days of dental school, Herb, and give me some impressions of, of your early days in dental school, how you felt about uh, uh, dentistry as a profession, as school, as an institution, and, and where you fit into that. Uh, well, as you can imagine, I was a very serious student at all times. Uh, not that I wasn't president of the class and president of this and president of everything else, but there was a serious side to me, a very serious side to me. And I revered education. I thought it was very important. I felt I never took a course that uh, I didn't learn something from, be it in, at the college or at the dental school. And uh, I just towed to the line and uh, found it was going easily. And uh, I discovered this was nice and comfortable for me. And I began to wonder what I would do as a full-time career. And that's where endodontics began to pop in. Uh, don't forget, it was not a recognized specialty in those days, and very few endodontists were, were specialists. Some of the biggest names, as we may talk about later, uh, were never specialists. They never limited their, their practices to endodontics. And I began questioning people in the endodontic department who were not endodontists, but general dentists interested in endodontics. And they told me, it's a nice thought, kid, but you can't make a living doing it. <laughs> so dental school was a... a an enjoyable time for you, would you say that? Uh, oh, sure it was. And, and, uh, and the in, associations you still... In, in a physiology class, while we were putting to sleep some huge tortoise, somebody on the other side of that tortoise asked if I would like to go on a blind date that Saturday night. That's how I met Joan, <laughs> and my wife. I think that's a wonderful story, <laughs> and that's something that uh, I did not know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so once you went through the dental school uh, environment, you had a sequence of Pennsylvania and Tufts and Beth Israel Hospital and run through those years of the sequence of what you did immediately following dental school. Okay. And that would be First of all, I, I want to go back to Martin Bernstein because that music professor did soften the rough edges on me. He, he humanized me in a sense that he made me think differently. And to give you one little example, because it's something I carry to this day, uh, I was asking him something about uh, graduation gift that my folks wanted to give me. And he said it very simply. He said, don't let it be anything that if you lose it, it'll make you feel badly. In other words, don't value things so much as ideas and people. And that had a great influence on me. But if we're talking now about subsequent to that, uh, mentors really came in big time, uh, and two of them particularly. Uh, one was Dr. Louis I. Grossman, who at that time was probably the most famous endodontist in the world and held forth at the University of Pennsylvania, as you know. Uh, and the other was Henry Goldman, the periodontist for whom the school in Boston is now named. Uh, and these two people had a huge influence on me. Uh, a friend of mine had been taking a residency with Henry uh, at the Beth Israel Hospital, where Henry had at that time the largest dental department uh, in the world. And I went up to meet Dr. Goldman, and I announced that I was doing endodontics. I was a self-declared endodontist at the Aberdeen Proving Grounds in Maryland, and uh, I wanted to be his endodontist. And he looked at me like I wasn't there and said, who are you <laughs> to make this declaration? And I told him, and he said, do you have boards? And I said, well, Dr. Goldman, there are no boards in endodontics. And he looked right through me and said, but there are going to be. I'm on a committee studying the subject. 
And the last thing he said is, do you know Dr. Grossman? I said, yes. He said, does Dr. Grossman know you? I said, no. And the interview terminated in five minutes when he said, when Dr. Grossman says you can be my endodontist in Boston, you come back, you'll be my endodontist in Boston, and dismissed me. So I got in my car <laughs> with Joan and drove down to the University of Pennsylvania the next day on the way back to Aberdeen. I knocked on Grossman's door and said, Goldman sent me. <laughs> and from that meeting with Grossman, uh, he started me in a series of continuing education courses that he was getting to be famous for at the University of Pennsylvania. And every time I had some leave time, I'd scrape that time together and go and take the courses with, with Lou Grossman. Uh, one of those courses was interesting because it was a two-week course, and on the second Tuesday, Joan began to have contractions for our first son. And I was very nice. I stayed with her that day, but <laughs> at 7 o'clock the next morning, I was back in Philadelphia with that course with Lou. And uh, Lou became my mentor in a sense, uh, and continued that way, and to, this, to the day he died, Joan was very friendly with MMA and uh, we were closely bound together. But there was Henry still out there in Boston. And uh, when I finished with the Army, they arranged a teaching research fellowship for me at Temple University, uh, which I took for a year, while I was waiting for Henry to call me to Boston. When would I be all right? And I recall one time Henry came down. It was about a year later. And we were walking through that cavernous clinic, as you may remember, at the University of Pennsylvania. And I said, I think he forgot me. And just as suddenly as he dismissed me a year earlier, he took me into a classroom, drew the outline of the building. He said, this is Beacon Street, and this is Bay State Road, and you'll be practicing here. I said, excuse me? He said, you'll be practicing here. And I said, what if I don't like it? He said, you're going to like it. <laughs> The upshot of this was I went, went to that building. I rented the space that he suggested. But before that, he had dentists waiting with patients for me. I could see them in his office. No rent, nothing of the sort. He wouldn't accept anything except the fact that I would be there. And he projected me into something I wasn't. Maybe it would be something I'd want to be when I grew up. But he projected me in a way not only with the dental community, but with the patients. The creme de la creme. Bay State Road then was like Holly Street in London. And I was the youngest person in the building by at least 25 years, the only one without a Harvard degree. But uh, suddenly I was a member of this community. And uh, that's really uh, the pro my being projected at a very early age, mid-20s. Uh, into a career that people had really put into my hands. It was for me to carry it or to drop it. Uh, but I guess I worked hard and, and carried it. So then Dr. Goldman called you. And he had me there, right? And he had you in Boston already. Yeah. And through that sequence, when you joined him, I know that there were many positions that you assumed with him. Um, Sequence those for us so we get the picture of you starting continuing education and, and through th that right. program. Let me, let me review the history yeah, of the school. That'd be great. Because it's a strange history for a school. Uh, at that time, it was the first dental school since, I guess, the war that was established. And it wasn't established as a normal dental school. What year are we talk about her? We are talking. I, I arrived in Boston in 1956. Okay. And uh, Henry was collecting a faculty of practitioners who would give about a day a week at the Beth Israel Hospital. And he was giving CE courses in a variety of subjects. And he wanted them all covered well. We had no idea why he was collecting us there. So in 1956, I had the teaching bug. And I was teaching on Friday afternoons at Tufts without salary. I'd just take my front surface mirror and uh, go down to Tufts and look at a few cases and uh, began my teaching career there. I did that for three years. Now, in 1959, Henry, who was a tremendous fundraiser and taught me some skills about that, which have served me very well in my career, uh, Henry was a great fundraiser. He had talked to people at Boston University 
into establishing a department of stomatology, mouth medicine, uh, in the Department of General Surgery at the Medical Center at Boston University. And uh, we went down there in dilapidated quarters, dilapidated, the basement of a pre-Civil War building. And uh, Henry started the school in, in there. Two old, dumpy brownstones. We would give lectures. It would be like a Dickens story <laughs> with snow coming in through broken window panes. And we started a school that had eight recognized specialties of dentistry. All eight of them, including public health, uh, started it without a dental school. We didn't know that Henry was planning the dental school soon. Uh, and there we functioned. Uh, I had a board-certified program in endodontics before the specialty of endodontics was approved. Uh, and all the others were certified as well. So we're going back to 1959, when we went over to BU. And in 1962, we talked the university into giving him a piece of ground. In 1963, we started the Goldman School of, no, Henry's name was attached to it later. Uh, at that time, it was not the Goldman School. He wouldn't have put up with, with such a, a titling of it. But he started the Boston University School of Graduate Dentistry, a dental school without pre-doctoral students. We continued with that for about 10 years. And then the current dean, Spencer Frankel, became the associate dean. And they began a pre-doctoral program as well. But for years, we still carried, Dick, we carried the name of the Boston University School, graduate school of dental medicine, even after we had the pre-doctoral program. And it was kind of a tough thing for the faculty to finally give up that name of the Boston University School of Graduate Dentistry, because it meant so much to us. And by that time, it meant a lot to the world, because Henry sent us out all over the world. He sent us out, as you know, I've lectured on every continent in the world, not all those imitations through Henry, but he trained us to take this material and take it out to the, to the corners of the world uh, and to proselytize for good dentistry. It, it was an exciting time, really an exciting time. Tell me about some of those overseas visits mm -hmm. where you take Joan and and you go and, and, and you, the, the best way of teaching, show them. Show it to them. Yeah, tell uh, me about some of those uh, visits that are uh, well, highlighted on, in your in, mind. In, in, in 1962, and I was 23 years old, I guess. No, not 23, 33. I went to uh, Torino, and a former student of ours from the Perio department, who was now a professor there, uh, arranged for me to give some lectures with demonstrations. Well, they accepted anything. I mean, they were so unsophisticated, it was extraordinary. Uh, but I did a, a non-surgical case, and I did a surgical case uh, without TV. TV came later. People would just form a big circle and walk around me. They were so unsophisticated, I really couldn't believe it. Uh, but what they saw, they were so impressed with that they started coming to BU for the continuing education courses, and uh, soon the invitations increased. Well, over the years, I found Dick, that this method of demonstrating what you're talking about and making it happen in front of them is the most convincing thing that you can possibly do uh, because they think you were a damn fool to come if it wasn't going to work. And as I indicated to you, I know previously, uh, in some of our conversations in the past, um, I would take a dental assistant, wouldn't dream of doing it without my own dental assistant, and sometimes it would take the husband and their children and whatever. And the honorarium had to include transportation for them, as well as for Joan and me, and then our kids. And there were many, many places who wanted, it, wanted this to happen. And do the live demo right in front of them. We filled, we can talk about endodontics later with root canal systems and lateral canals. We have filled huge screens, 30-foot screens, uh, with lateral canals on patients live in the other room while the people in the amphitheater are seeing that work. It was it was a lot of fun, and it was kind of makes you feel feel strong that you've gotten your ideas across if you can produce it right in front of their very eyes. Now, I, I recall reading through your CV that you've lectured in uh, in uh, over 30 countries. You have over 100 publications, and you've done 32 universities, um, which is quite a record. I, that's pretty busy stuff. But knowing you, you're a pretty busy guy. 
Now, let's just, uh, you said an honorarium must be included for Joan and the kids. Let me hear about that. Let me hear about the kids and Joan a little bit here. Give me your family life that uh, has helped make Herb Shoulder that we know today. Well, you've just seen a little of Joan and, and me together, so you know what the relationship is. <laughs> it is... Uh, it is symbiotic, and we are tied together somehow spiritually, but uh, without thinking about the spirituality of it. But in the reality that uh, there's nothing that I do that isn't dependent upon her, which I'm very happy to say. And uh, we work as a unit. So when I started having the trips overseas, uh, we would get somebody to stay with the kids, and Joan didn't care for that too much. But from the time the kids maybe when the older one was seven and the younger one was three or four, or maybe three and, and six, uh, we took them overseas. We took them to Rome, we took them to Bogota, we took them wherever I was going, and the sponsors were willing to do this. Uh, so the kids have seen a lot, and we've done a lot as a family. And where, where are the children now? Or where are they? <laughs> well, one of them is an archivist for the American Jewish Historical Society. Okay. And um, he gathers material on, on interesting uh, people, Jews in America. This has nothing to do with theology. This has nothing to do with anything but uh, what happens, has happened to Jews in America. And of course, they've been here since the 1500s, uh, coming up from Brazil uh, by way of Spain after the Inquisition. But in any event, he, one of the things that he does is to prepare biographies of people who might be interesting, and then they're published. And at the present time, he's researching a Dr. Gonzalez. Dr. Gonzalez was a dentist somewhere in the South. He has all the statistics on it, who apparently received an honorary degree from the University of Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> he's working on that at the present time. So he's an archivist and loves it. He was big in family genealogy, and from that he got into the other job, this, this job. Now, the younger son, he's kind of specialized in marathon running. <laughs> He's not good enough to make a living at it. <laughs> so he's a lovable guy. Uh, and uh, he's actually made a living, such as it is, uh, with running, uh, with arranging uh, races for corporations and uh, uh, putting together things and advertising campaigns for running shoes. He's an expert in this kind of field. And he loves it, and we should get used to it. And I guess we have. but. Uh, He's a marathon aficionado. I can't complain too much because he ran his first Boston Marathon when he was 15, and I ran the Boston Marathon 25 times. Uh, didn't finish too many times, <laughs> but nevertheless, I ran the Boston Marathon all that time. And uh, later on, we took the graduate students out there. They'd have to run with me. And I tell you, people who sweat together, stick together, and that's helped us to knit uh, the graduates in the program around certain things, and that running was one of them. So Rich got caught up in it. Well, from being from Boston, it's an appropriate, uh, appropriate endeavor. Let, let's then go back just a little bit here to uh, your time at, uh, as a professor. Um, and knowing many of your students, um, knowing that you have educated a, a good majority, well, I, I don't know if that's true or not, but many, many of the uh, specialists in endodontics throughout this country, you are responsible for helping train or training. Uh, give me some ideas of that program, how that got going to be such a massive, important program that's had impact on all of us throughout the, uh, the world and especially in the United States. Well, the, the number is actually 363 current graduates, which are 10 percent of every endodontist in the United States and a very good smattering in other continents as well. Um, it's very interesting that our first student was Cyril Gom, who, as you know, has been very active in the International College of Dentists. Uh, Cyril, uh, I guess Cyril's responsible for getting, for igniting us. Cyril was introduced to me by a dentist uh, who must have treated some patients that Cyril had referred from Nova Scotia to Boston. And then the dentist said Cyril might want to come down and see me and uh, see what could happen. And Cyril became my first graduate student. Mm -hmm. Now, in those days, we didn't have much of a faculty, so Cyril's course was basically being in my office <laughs> a great deal. We started Cyril in 1959, 
He was graduated in 1960, and I remember graduation, I made some comment that Mrs. Goldman thought was cute. I said, uh, this has got to be some kind of educational experience. It's the only school we know where you have a one-to-one -one student faculty relationship. But Cyril was our first student. And then the next year we had two, and then the thing grew and grew uh, and grew. So you have an, I, my understanding is you have sort of an alumni group. Um, what's happening in that? We have a mafiosa mondiale. <laughs> we, we have a, a worldwide uh, uh, mafiosa, but of course my Italian friends refer to mafia as simply a friend helps a friend. So that's what we do. And it's a cosa nostra, which only means our thing, because our thing is endodontics. But we've got them all over. We, we have a directory of our students. Uh, with their families, the, their wives' names, and the children's names, and the office phone numbers, and the home phone numbers, and the fax machines, which we're using all the time uh, to keep in touch. We have our own publication that comes out, scientific publication, that comes out three times a year. Uh, we have uh, competing annual meetings. Our real annual meeting takes place in the, in the fall, but last week we had uh, a winter meeting uh, out in Vail, uh, and then we have other meetings as well. Uh, this is a very, very tightly bound group of people who are bound in what they perceive, at least, to be quality endodontics, uh, which they believe in. They believe it's true. And um, they go out and they have study clubs, which are not our graduate students. And they multiply and multiply and they go out and they just want to teach this. They're excited. Some years ago, I, I wrote a, a sentence in a textbook by uh, Richard Burns and Steve Cohen. And I said, God, I gave you guys the best sentence. I wish I kept that for something for myself. And I ended the chapter on the future of endodontics, and it end began with a conjunction for effect. And endodontics will be fun. The practicing of endodontics will be fun. And for me, it's been one great big game. It's been. Uh, fun, and if you like what you're doing, uh, if your work can be your hobby, and you can make a living and help people and do good with it, you can't ask more. Let me ask you, too, with all the publications you've done, is there a particular interest in research uh, that you've had through the years, other than helping others and looking at systems? I know uh, some of those issues, you. Some of those publications, of course, are assisting your residents or your, those you train. But about your own personal interest in research, is there one area you'd like to, uh, to mention? Well, that's changed over the years. The second year that I was an endodontist, I guess George Stewart, who's a very fine endodontist in Philadelphia, uh, invited me to speak at a program of the American Association of Endodontics, which I did. And uh, I spoke about a subject which was rather novel to them, uh, but something I was being consumed with at the, at the time I went into practice. When I went into practice, I was practicing with silver cones. And that's what I learned in Philadelphia, and that's what I believed in, and that seemed fun. And after a while, I discovered that the things that they told me uh, were not what I was finding to be the clinical reality. So research, what is the reality? Is it the experiment, or is it uh, the clinical outcomes? And uh, I began to question uh, much of what was said at the time. Now, don't forget when, when we started this, when Cyril came to me, uh, our friends in Philadelphia have been at this for a long time. And they are friends. But they believe that 20% of endodontic cases failed because they simply had to fail. Now, you've done some apicolectomies in your day. Uh, and uh, when you went to dental school, when I went to dental school, you took out what we thought were cysts, and you cleaned out the epithelium, and you were afraid to go to the apex, and you were afraid of excess material, and it wasn't supposed to work. And I discovered that all these things were working, and that the, what I have coined the lesion of endodontic origin, instead of periapical granulomas or periapical cysts, because they're not, they're not all at the apex. They can be mid-root. They can be at the cervical part. Uh, are the results of toxins leaking out of root canal systems? So now we're talking about root canal systems instead of a root canal. 
And don't think every endodontist in the world was happy to be reminded these are root canal systems. Now, they knew that, but they would avoid it. Dick, you're not an endodontist, but do you realize that about 85% of upper first molars have two canals in the mesiobuccal root? No. They didn't tell me about that, but of course we have it. And our graduate students now are working with uh, surgical microscopes. Every one of our graduate students has a surgical microscope that they can pull down as they work. And this is going to be common in dentistry. We didn't start this. This is going to be common. So early on, way back then, I was telling them about root canal systems and showing them lesions that they thought were miracles, that I thought was routine, that were working. So the early part of the research uh, was doing statistical evaluations uh, to demonstrate to them the healing capacities. And some of our closest friends and endodontists who you respect enormously, and I do as well, um, they couldn't believe this, and they would argue. Uh, there's the Dr. I.B. Bender, and I know you know him, and I think it was his 80th birthday after he spoke in Boston, and he went back. He has Parkinson's, but it doesn't seem to affect his writing. It, it shakes, but it goes across the line beautifully. And he had a little note and said, Herm, he said, now that I'm growing up, and I hope that you're beginning to grow up, can we be friends? Mm -hmm. He said, I think I agreed with you all the time, but it was so much fun arguing with you. So the early research was just convincing people uh, of what was going on in a clinical way. A Dr. Maslow, Maury Maslow, who's a very famous person in dentistry, you may know him, uh, he indicated to me once, he said, gee, you should have been a scientist. And I said, Maury, I am a scientist. I'm a clinical scientist. So we started out with clinical activities. As times went along and we knew the lesions healed, uh, I became more interested in materials. So we got involved in things we might talk about later or whenever you like, on the vertical compaction of warm gutta percha technique, where we warm the gutta percha and instead of pressing it in laterally, which most people were doing then, we press it vertically, uh, like taking pizza dough and filling a form, shepherding the material in, and watching the lateral canals get filled and be gratified by it. Uh, so we began to talk about warm gutter percha, and these were things, none of which I woke up one day and said, gee, I've got a great idea. I think I'll do this. Uh, they just evolved. So there was the evolution of this, and then for maybe 20 years, the running contestation between my good friends who knew damn well that it worked, <laughs> but weren't prepared to give up what they were doing, and for me to find words that would bring them in and not frighten them away. Uh, which I believe that the healing potential for every lesion of endodontic origin is 100%. So when I would say that, the audiences would feel, gee whiz, now do I have to go out and get that? They didn't like that. Uh, it put a burden on them. Well, the potential is 100%, but that means you have to do certain things. And in this clinical research, we found out you have to clean out the root canal systems. So the bugs in the bone amount to nothing uh, if you clean out the bugs in the root canal systems. So then we had to devise different ways how to clean and shape root canals. It used to be instrumentation. Now it's cleaning and shaping. And I've been thrilled to see these words accepted around the world. But I had to change from threatening the audience, which I never meant to do, by saying, you're going to go home and they're all going to work this way. No, if you do what you're supposed to do, <laughs> they're all going to work that way. The capacity to heal is 100%. But the mechanics and the complications of these root canal systems don't necessarily allow you to get that. But the harder you try, the more conscientious you are, the closer you're going to come to the 100% healing. Let's, let's take a break, Herb, for a few minutes. Uh, we've gone a long time, and let's just take a little rest. Fine. Herb, I know we've talked pretty much about uh, your education and uh, but let's go in. I know you've been extremely active in dental organizations. Uh, let me just ask you, I know you were uh, elected uh, first vice president of the American Dental Association. Tell me about some of those relationships. You were House of Delegates uh, representative from Massachusetts for many years in Mass. Uh, 
Tell me a little bit about the, your activity in, in all these organizations that have had impact on dentistry. Well, I, a little while ago, I indicated to you that uh, this is sort of a game. And uh, just about everything I do, I take as sort of a, a game, an entertaining activity uh, of serious import, perhaps. Um, but it, it takes me away from the practice and takes me away from other things <coughs> and gets me involved in what basically are the fundamental things that make things work. Uh, somebody comes up with a scientific invention, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to succeed. You have to convince people the social scene must be ready to receive it. Otherwise, they're not going to want to receive it. So I've always been very people-oriented uh, and enjoy doing these things. Now, I indicated to you before that when I got out of college at 19 and didn't have a clue as to what I wanted to do, I thought I might like to. Maybe, maybe I'm fantasizing now what, what it was like, but I really think I would have preferred to keep doing that for the next 20 years, being president of the class and whatever, uh, and just do all these multiple activities. So I've been into things for a long time. I, I like to size up the social issues uh, because that's where I think progress takes place. Uh, I have friends who are major businessmen, and what's your greatest talent? Well, the balance sheets. No, it isn't. You're a good psychologist. You can't do business unless you know the people you're doing business with, from the banker to the person who's buying your, the tie in, in, in the store. So I'm very much interested in these processes and how you can affect people's behavior by affecting change in them in terms of how they see the things that are really important in their lives anyway, and not the things that are stewing them up that have very little relevance. So from a very early time, um, I got involved in these things. Now, Dick, remember when I went to college, I was too young to be in the Second World War. I was a, a junior air raid warden. <laughs> but when I got to school, people had come back from the GI Bill of Rights capacity to go to school. They, they had this, this thing. So the average person in my class was five years older than I was in college, and I was president of the class. So you may say, well, how did that all affect you? And it didn't affect me at all. I was just doing my thing, and they were doing theirs, and we felt very comfortable with each other. So I was always into this kind of activity, going back to the sixth grade. Uh, it just was part of my being, becoming interested in this kind of thing. Now, with that, it was perfectly natural that when I started in dentistry, uh, I would attend district dental meetings and see what was going on. And uh, quickly, I found out that you could participate in things. And suddenly, I found I was being elected to various positions. Then I had to develop a technique of getting out from behind the podium and getting in front of it and say, I'm the same guy you knew yesterday before I had this job. And if I could be doing this, you can be doing this, and we can be doing it together to keep the contact. And that kind of worked. Uh, I found issues. Uh, I don't think I invented the issues. I I think there were many issues in dentistry at that time uh, that needed people to articulate them and, and to speak for them. And I found out I was the person who was doing this. And, and people were liking to elect me to places. And there, again, it was to keep contact with them. Because if they say, you go out there and take care of it, we'll watch you, that's no good. We have to do this all together. So I would apply that with almost everything that occurred in life from social organizations, religious institutions, you name it. Uh, I was out there somehow doing this. Massachusetts Dental Association, for example, for many years, Dental Society, Massachusetts Dental Society, used to elect a delegate for one year. It was like taking a trip to, a, to some far off place. And when they first nominated me, I said, guys, I don't want to go because I'm on the program speaking anyway. Most of these times, I'd be speaking on the scientific program and running out of the house and getting slides and going back. I was doing all of this stuff. And uh, I said, there's no effect that you can have in one year there. You've got to be there a year or two and see what's going on in the House of Delegates and make some friends and find what the process is. And don't be a smart ass who's going to get up and think you're going to overpower 418 people who are pretty smart, too. Uh, 
And they said, that's a good idea. So I was the first delegate, I guess, who, who had continuity and could get to know the people and know the system. And that seemed to work, uh, work very, very well. Um, and the same process would happen in the American Association of Endodontists or, or others, uh, where they would be happy to have me doing these things. And um, I took TV training for the American Association of Endodontists at one time. And it was interesting TV training. And um, if there was the unfriendly interview and the friendly <laughs> interview and the whatever kind of interview. And at one point, they asked some question. I forget exactly what it was. And the 12 of us answered the question. And at the end of it, uh, I guess they, she thought I had done the best job. They said, now why did you say that? And she said, you're the most credible. So I don't know what it is, but the sense of credibility. And during most of my political activities, it's been on credibility and on uh, trying to uh, do the right thing, if you will. Uh, if we want to be very introspective, I, I think I've been Mr. Clean in all these things. Reliable, Mr. Clean. Uh, no deals, everything on the surface, nothing hidden. And it's fun. <laughs> if, if people want you to do this and you're doing it, it's fun. So we applied that uh, just accidentally to whatever there was, and pretty soon uh, I became active in these various things and, and worked with the issues. The ADA is very interesting, and uh, with no disrespect, because everybody in the House knew what my issues were in the last days. In the last days, uh, my issues were changing the continuity of the president of the ADA, which presently now is president-elect and then president and out. <laughs> and instead of putting people on a pinnacle, they take them to a precipice and put the foot in their back at the end of that last session, and you are gone. <laughs> no immediate past presidents, new people in, king for a day, for a year. And while we've had people of substance in those roles, real substance, there's no chance to come to grips with the issues because there's no continuity. And I won most of the things in the House that I wanted, but I couldn't win on this one. And the issue is, let's have continuity uh, so people could grab the issues and say, this is not my year. What are you going to do in your year? No, this is a year in the continuity of the association. And what can we do this year to further the long-range plans of the association? I couldn't sell it. I remember traveling to uh, Australia, South Africa with a very dear friend of mine and a very fine president of the ADA uh, in his day. And he said, Herb, you'd be terrific. You have one problem. I said, what is that? He said, you're too serious about the issues. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're delighted that you were taking on those issues. And it's too bad that more people don't uh, have the credibility that you've had through the years, because that's very important in our profession, which is the best in the world at this point. Now, let me ask you also, um, I know you've been ser you've served on the American Board of Endodontics. Yes, I have. And uh, is there anything that you'd like to, uh, I'm not very familiar with boards because I'm a general dentist, but uh, how does that function and, and, and when did it start? Well, endodontics was the last special day, I guess, until did we accept radiology at the last House of Delegates meeting? I don't think so, not yet. I mean, not yet. Not yet. So we, we are the last specialty yes. to, to be recognized by the ADA. Uh, organized, probably incorporated in Illinois in about 1959, but uh, had to understand this with the ADA that we were not going to give examinations until the House of Delegates accepted endodontics as a specialty. Now to go back into those days, Dick, when I, when I went into endodontics, there were, I think, 50 endodontists in the United States. And the big names that we know and the leaders and the teachers were not full-time endodontists. Lou Grossman never limited his practice to endodontics. Mm. Ralph Sommer at the University of Michigan, who was a pillar of endodontics, never limited his practice to endodontics. Darrell Ostrander, who was a great endodontist and president of the ADA as well, never limited his practice to endodontics. They were doing general dentistry to make a living. 
because people couldn't make a living doing endodontics. So there were about 50 people who had limited themselves, and some of them were well-known and some of them were not. But that's all there were at that time. I'm embarrassed to say that I was a full professor at Boston University before Lou Grossman was a full professor at the University of Pennsylvania, because that's how little they valued this prize person who literally uh, was the shiny light of endodontics in, in his generation and the generation to follow. So in 1965, the House of Delegates of the ADA finally approved endodontics as a specialty. And that's the first time we gave board examinations. And uh, technically, it measures from that. But uh, we've talked about other endodontists and friends of, of yours uh, who limited their practices after I limited to mine, and they're 15 years older than I. And some didn't limit at all. So the growth has been meteoric. Once it became organized as a specialty, um, the schools began to develop really good programs, uh, increasing in quality all the time and continuing to increase in quality now. And um, we are not the smallest by any means. We're about mid-size in terms of the number of people certified by the American Board of Endodontics. Maxillofacial surgery and orthodontics, which have been around much longer, have much larger groups. But nevertheless, we have the same requirements and the same types of uh, examinations. And um, it's a thriving, thriving activity yes. at the present time. And it was fun to be there in the relatively early stages. Now, talking of the early stages, <laughs> where, where will endodontics be, in your opinion, in the year 2015 or 2020? Uh, you're the futurist. You can know how to think out of the box. Where are we going, Herb? Endodontics specifically? Or yes. Dentistry in general? Or which? <laughs> all the above. All the above. <coughs> Let's go to dentistry first. <coughs> Dentistry's had a major change in terms of um, the material has to be learned, new technology, new dental students, uh, struggles of the cost of private dental education, even state schools are now charging fees, and some considerable. There are dental students who leave school literally $100,000, $150,000 in debt. Uh, lots of graduate programs have tuitions uh, of $30,000 a year. And the students are ending up with uh, certain financial issues they have to deal with as they get out. Managed care is with us, and managed care is not going to go away. We're going to have to do the best we can with managed care, because there's no way that organized dentistry can speak against it as an institution if members of the association are practicing in these environments because they like it or because of need. So a lot of the students who graduate today um, tend to be in a problem, have a problem in their lives, and they don't know whether to go to work for a large group of general dentists, possibly for cut-rate dentistry, or whether they dare to take the loans to open up a practice of their own. I think the future is going to have a cross between those who are willing to take the risk and have the rewards, and those who may be into this kind of working mode for the rest of their lives. Now, you can make a living doing that. And even though few endodontists do that, there are endodontists who make very comfortable livings visiting one office one day of the week and another office another day of the week. And I don't think it's a preferred mode of most endodontists, but these people don't have the burden, and they're willing to do that. Now, that's the most optimistic way to view this issue. A more pessimistic way to view the issue is that for some of them, it's very difficult to work their way out of debt. And some of them are as much debt when they finish school as you or I would think there was money in the world. You know, we, we, we cut our throats if we had to deal with that kind of debt. And how they deal with that uh, is going to be an issue uh, for the public they serve and for the profession and um, what kind of motivation they will have if that is their sole form of, of practice. 
So I see a conflict that we're just going to have to work out. We're going to have to work this out, organized dentistry, uh, working in concert with everyone else, uh, to try to make these people, many of them don't join the ADA, when they get in that mode, they don't feel they can afford the dues. They surely can, but they don't feel that they can. They feel that they can't. So we're developing a problem for the American Dental Association, which you know about as well as I do, Dick, of declining percentage of the market. The American Medical Association has had less than 50% for ages because so many people belong to the specialty groups, they don't feel they need mother AMA. But the American Dental Association has been stronger because if you pay your dues, you do want to have your say. So we're going to have to be very careful how to get these people all together. Also, we have different ethnic groups that are coming through, very different ethnic groups. For many schools, the Oriental students are the prize students. They, they want to get the people from the Orient first and recently arrived or first generation. Uh, they seem to respect education, and they seem to pay the fees, whether they're state schools or whether they're private schools, uh, and they're very good students, but their outlook on the American Dental Association has to be nourished very early in their careers, because in California, I believe there are Philippine Dental Associations of American Dentists, or Korean <coughs> Associations of American Dentists. And that's a very difficult problem for the ADA. They're working on it. I'm very concerned about it. Uh, and into the future, we're going to have to do something to, to bring them all together. So when John Zapp and others come to speak before Congress, they're really speaking for organized dentistry and not for, my word, a minority, or if not a minority, a shrinking majority. That, that's a very important, very important issue. Silver cone, gutta percher, what's next? Anything on the horizon? Well, I, I don't want to leave gutta percha too soon. <laughs> no, well, okay, <laughs> I understand. But uh, you know, I learned with silver cone also, and then, sure. of course, and then we. Latin May I ask you a question? Well, I don't know. Dick, what school did you go to? Case Western Reserve. Okay. Yeah. That silver that was cone. not a bastion of endodontic. It was not, no. I don't know that we had any specialists okay. there. Okay. And they well, do we, now. But you you had a periodontist, endodontist, very nice fellow. Yes. Who tried to do something with each of them and was a very, very good teacher and a nice gentleman, yes. but there's no way you can learn under those circumstances the details of endodontics as they exist today. So silver cones are basically gone. They're, they're basically gone. And for the most part, it's gutta percha. And for the most part, it's warm gutta percha. I'm a, apparently am the father of the vertical compaction of warm gutta percha technique. Uh, but if you warm gutta percha, however you want to put it into a tooth, whether it's with a gun or make soup out of it or put it on a stick, <laughs> which some people are doing now, uh, and putting it into a canal, most people are warming gutta percha in some form and pressing it into the root canal system as they've come to understand the complexities of the root canal system. Would that it was not so complex. Endodontics is the kind of thing now where the less you know, the easier it is to do. <laughs> and the more you know, the more complicated it is to do, because you find more to do. <laughs> you find more to do. One of our graduate students, who has been in practice for 18 years, came and showed me a case the other day and said, gee, if it weren't for you, I'd never be able to do that. No, no, Tom, you will be able to do that without me. Uh, four roots, five canals, two with right angle bends, and all filled to the radiographic terminus of the canals. The quality of work improves as you understand the complexity of what you have to do, and if you don't understand that complexity. So gutta percha seems to be, at the present time, the material which is still best suited. Don't forget, it's been around for over 100 years. Uh, it's not experimental material. So instead of doing lateral condensation, which was popular for many, many years, much of what I had to do was to teach people if you can push it to the side and hope that the gutta percha cones stick together, it's easier to warm it and push it into a properly prepared root canal system. I think there's going to be a lot more changes in instrumentation. There's so many changes now, and there might be changes in other things, but I don't think, except for novelty, that there's going to be much change in gutta percha over the period of time that you're referring to. 
Looking back at a very full career that you've had, and it started very early when you graduated from college before you were 20, what would you change if you went back? Uh, oh, that's a great question, though. What would you do differently? Uh, I don't even know if you've thought about that. You, you're moving so fast in all directions. Uh, is there anything that would come to mind? What do you want to be remembered for, Herb, if somebody asked you that? It, uh, I thought about that on the plane, as a matter of fact. Good, you know, yeah. I, was, I was thinking about that. Um, what have I become? I've mentioned to you that I would go to the American Association of Dental Schools meetings, and I was active in their House of Delegates, yes. and I was chairman of the endodontic section of the AADS and the continuing education section of the AADS. Um, and there they would say, gee, this, this, this clinician is coming into our place, and the House of Delegates, the ADA, would say this teacher is coming into our place. I didn't view myself, even with all that early teaching, as a teacher. I viewed myself as a clinician who taught. That was my view. As I got older and developed this huge cadre of people uh, who are so self-conscious of what they're doing and bound together uh, in this Boston University Endodontic Alumni Association, I guess I'm seeing myself more now as a, as a teacher who was also a clinician. And the only thing that I might say off the top of my head to that question is I guess I would have grown up earlier, which means that I would have had fewer confrontations, which seemed to be the only way to do it then. And of course, it didn't seem to decrease my popularity, and maybe I was, I was an enfant terrible <laughs> in those days. They didn't know what to do with me, but they kept coming back to the lectures all the time. <laughs> they, they didn't want to do it because they thought it was complicated, but they came back to the lectures all the time. And I'm a decent communicator. I think if I could have communicated this better and in a less challenging way, but then again, I'm not sure it would have succeeded if I did that. <laughs> I would guess you would have, because you, uh, you've succeeded in everything else. Now, wh what do you still, you've done most things in endodontics. You've done most things in dentistry and in education. What do you still want to do? I know you're working to, uh, to uh, pass on the virtues of, of, of uh, the school. Uh, to improve. I know you're working in foundation work for the yes. endodontics plus your own university. Um, what still remains to be done in that area for you? Well, let's go back to one of my prime mentors between Lou and, and Henry Goldman. Henry Goldman was a great fundraiser, an enormous fundraiser. And he had the nerve to confront his wealthy patients, which became my wealthy patients. But I couldn't approach them the way Henry would do and just take him to dinner and say, Harry, I need $100,000, and come away with this. Maybe not more often than not, but more often than I was able to believe as I would watch him do this. And he would take me with him sometime, and I would see Henry do this. Now, that is not necessarily the way I raise money, but I probably raise as much money now as Henry had raised. And my perception is you cannot have good education unless you have some money. There's a terrible problem, Dick, terrible problem in getting good dental teachers because the practice today is so lucrative that people who are teaching hear their students are making more money than they are three years out of school. So it's extremely difficult to keep people, even endodontists, extremely difficult to keep them. So schools have to have more money. And most organizations need more money. And it's OK to talk about money. Now, years ago, years ago, when we had only three or four graduate students, I remember at a meeting of the American Association of Endodontists inviting them to breakfast. And we had eggs benedict and bacon. Can you imagine me, look at me, eating eggs benedict and bacon? My god. <laughs> I'd play with my plate, and they thought the school was paying for that breakfast. Heck no, I was paying for the breakfast. I was investing in developing an alumni association. And we've done that. And in the case of the AAE, which we can talk about, because we started a $5 million campaign 
over a period of five years, and we have now pledged for $10 million and $6 million in the till. But let's go back to the school. Uh, you can't do anything unless you have money. So without going through the step-by-step -step stages of it, we have an outside source of, of income which is greater than my department budget except for salaries. So except for salaries which the school provides, I'm receiving five to six times my annual budget from alumni. We've established the three things at the school. The students wanted to name a chair for me. And that was going to cost a million dollars at that time. And it took a little while, and we had the million dollars, and now there's a million five in there. The money they send on a regular basis uh, constitutes the opportunity to send young faculty people to meetings and to send students to lectures and to move things around and just do things where the other departments think money grows on trees. It doesn't. You treat your students right, and it comes back to you. And treat every student as a potential donor and every person as a family member. My phone rings six or seven times a day from an alumnus. And before I pick it up, Dick, the answer is going to be yes. Only once in a while they're going to ask, how's my health? But the answer is yes, I can call that person. Yes, we'll try to do that for him. Yes, we're going to do that. So we have the source of income. We have dentists in group practices who, when the, the machine cuts the checks for the doctors, they cut a check for my department. We have a, depart we have a practice out in Arizona. Uh, the checks are now at the level of $1,150 a month that come in on a regular basis. We have endodontists who leave their credit card numbers. And we take $150 out of that every month. But it's kind of inspiring, and there's nothing really like it, but the checks simply pour out of the mail. And I'm spending a lot of time thanking people. You may know that Joan and I made a large gift to the university, a very substantial gift to the university, uh, to name the Joan and Herbert Shoulder Endodontic Research Laboratory. Uh, I wanted her name first, and she made me very happy. She let me do that. <laughs> and I told the university we'd have a million dollars before the year was out. Well, in 11 months, I have the million dollars by getting some alumni to, say, to give $50,000 each over a period of five years. This is not for everybody, but everybody gives us something. And I got these people together, and they agreed to do that, and there's a million dollars for a research lab which has turned the direction of the research that I'm involved in now from direct clinical research to very, very basic science research, to cellular research, to enzyme research. And the students, you'll get a kick out of this since you say you know me and you're getting to know me better. Uh, the students are winning so many prizes at the American Association of Endodontists that you think it's fixed. Several years ago, the uh, AAE gave me one of their awards which I was very happy to receive. Is that the Grossman Award, or the Coolidge Award? Coolidge came first. I know you got them both. And the very next year, okay. they gave the I know you got them both. No, I'm not the only one to have two, and Dr. Bender has had three. He, got, he has the Summer Award as well. But no one had ever received two in a row, back to back. And that year, two of my students won first prize, one in the essay research reports and one in the poster clinic. And I'll tell you, I was dancing around. I was happier for them having won those awards than for my receiving the two awards back to back. This is pure research, things that get published in the journals of cellular biology, things that get published in papers of enzyme chemistry, and things that put in medical pu publications as well, all have influence in bone formation and bone resorption, which have relevance on lesions of endodontic origin, uh, done in laboratories uh, sponsored by, where most of the sponsorship uh, is from NIH grants of millions of dollars. And our students have access to this. Uh, and we're into that kind of thing. So if you looked at my more recent papers, you'd find it difficult to read the names <laughs> you know, yes. of, of, of the titles. Uh, and we've gotten into that. And I'm having a ball at this stage, you know, spending more time doing that. But I can't stress enough 
the importance of students being taught to express their gratitude by giving back in a very tangible way. And our students have been marvelous, marvelous with us. There's nothing like it in the dental school, and there's nothing like it in the medical center. But uh, it's not an accident. You make them feel good on being together. We have only two children. And neither of these guys seem as if they're going to be presenting us with grandchildren. And I've said many, many times at our meetings, at banquets, because I mean this sincerely, Joan and I have more than two children. We have presently 363 children, some of whom are older than we are. <laughs> but nevertheless, it's all family. Uh, and they go out of their way uh, to be good to us and, and to look after it and to make sure this endodontic thing works. There's an Italian expression, si mangia bene, si viva bene, si dorma bene in Italia. You eat better, you live better, you sleep better in Italy. Well, you might say, well, that's nonsense. No, if you believe it, it's magic. If you believe that the wine grows better on your side of the hill than on the other side of the hill, then it's real. And we've got this thing about endodontics that we think is live and vibrant and reaches out to the whole world community. And everybody's welcome to come to BU and, and join in this, to be inspired in it somehow. And at the same time, we know it's a, it's a shtick. Mm -hmm. But we believe it. <laughs> and if you believe it, it's a reality and it works. And it's, it's, a marvelous, uh, it's a marvelous thing to see how it's grown over a period of years. Well, I believe you. I have some kids living in Italy, and they don't do badly. No. And they, th and they believe it. Yeah. Well, it's been a wonderful afternoon that we've had this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, on behalf of uh, the International College, I thank you for expressing what you've expressed this afternoon. I think we know Herb Schilder a little better uh, because of this afternoon. I think I would say clinician. You married up, Herb. I'm learning that. <laughs> Teacher is, is so important. Administrator, dental activist, researcher, you've done it all. And thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. I know the snowstorm created all sorts of terrible problems for you, but you got here. And I think that's the way your whole career's been. Whatever the problem is, you beat it. And thank you so much for being with us. Dick, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you and to receive this honor, which I, I recognize very, very much.